Welcome to DeFi, the podcast making the most important projects in DeFi easy to understand and accessible to all. This week on DeFi, we have Blackpool, the first quantitative hedge fund for NFTs. Thanks a lot for coming. Today we have AJ and Tony from Blackpool. First, I'd kind of like to to ask you guys to define yourself as a quantitative hedge fund for NFTs. How do I intro you? You know, is that how is that is that what you're sticking with? That's that's a really good question. Is that what we're sticking with? I'd say we're definitely sticking with that, but for a more normy answer, just how to explain what is Blackpool, you could almost just be as simple as NFT exposure, right? I mean, people are hearing about NFTs. They're just starting to know what it is, uh, at least between myself and, and family and friends trying to explain Blackpool. They know what NFTs are now. And then I tell them like, hey, you don't have time to, to play all these games. You don't you don't have an army of scholars who are going to play Axie for you. And you're not going to be flipping JPEGs on OpenSea all day. But you want exposure. You know NFTs are going to be huge. So how do you get the upside? You just you just own Blackpool token. <laughs> we'll do it for you. And so mechanically, how does that work? That's a great question. So the Blackpool token is a governance token of our DAO. And within the DAO, we hold all of our NFT assets. So first off, you're getting, you're getting uh, quasi-ownership and price appreciation exposure to all of our NFT assets. And we have our metrics page on our website, which shows the value of all those assets. I think today it's somewhere around $20 million worth of NFTs. But then the thing that's really unique about Blackpool, because there are some other uh, NFT DAO token projects out there, what's unique about us is that we're mainly focused on yield generating NFTs. So this is not a we're not buying art and different profile pictures and trying to flip them and see how high they go in price. Price appreciation is nice. The whole market's going to go up. But what we're really focused on and why we're able to say we're a quant hedge fund is that we are focused on generating yield every week and and distributing that to our Blackpool token holders. So it's more of a, hey, would you like, and we haven't quoted a, a percentage yet, but, you know, hey, would you like 10, 15, 20% uh return just by staking your BPT tokens. I think most people would say, yes, that sounds great. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for giving like a a kind of high level vision of black gold. People are only just starting to wrap their heads around NFTs, like even within crypto and or DeFi, you know, you guys have come along with a, a quote unquote quantitative hedge fund. Curious to know, I mean, how you guys ended up in this position, like what led you to this? I mean, was it straight into into NFTs or did you come here via some sort of other vertical of, of crypto? And yeah, it'd be, it'd be really curious to hear from you all on this one. Sure, I'll, I'll take it again, but then yeah, we'll, we'll pass it around to the guys. So, I mean, Blackpool, the idea, so Julian and uh, Max, who's of course on the core team as well. So they had this idea, you know, they saw some of these projects that, gosh, must be 18 months ago that they were having this conversation and said, hey, you know, there's all these cool NFTs and there's these games where you can play to earn. And, but we don't have time for that because we have full-time jobs and working on other projects. But like, how do we get exposure to that? And how do we provide that exposure to other people? And that was it, right? They just saw that it's a thing happening and they wanted in. <laughs> and they decided instead <laughs> of uh, setting up some sort of private little operation for them to benefit, they said, hey, we can benefit, but we can also like make this a huge thing and get everyone in on it. And then, uh, yeah, I think we all, everyone on the core team senses, we come from different backgrounds, but, but mostly through, through crypto. I mean, I, I was day trading altcoins and now I quit my job and was doing that. And then I, I came about, uh, so rare, which is one of our, our verticals at Blackpool and met Max through playing that game and then heard about Blackpool from him. And so then one thing became another and now here I am. So. <laughs> Amazing. And just on so rare. So could you give like a, a little explanation about how so rare works and, and, and perhaps like, you know, what you look for when you're making a trade? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I was just thinking about it this morning, like actually the, the simplest, just like from a mechanics and financial pr- perspective is that I actually think about so rare as just like a high stakes poker game. Like that's how we're able to have so much 
assets under management while it being managed by just three people versus Tony will will jump in and talk about our Axie vertical later where we've got hundreds of people playing with almost the same amount uh, of AUM, you know, several millions of dollars, but it takes several hundred people to play. There's different types of games. So anyways, so Rare is essentially a high stakes poker game, but instead of poker chips and and cards, regular playing cards, you're playing with uh, uh, soccer football players and trading cards. Uh, yeah, so so I mean, in terms of, geez, how, how I play that game, it's <laughs> yeah. There's a lot that goes into it. I was literally before this just on the call with our developers, and you know we've got all sorts of internal uh, tools to, to help us find things that the normal user is definitely not looking at. So we've got some pretty advanced uh, metrics to to uncover value and to you know find the next great player optimize our, our lineups that we set every week. So, and those for, who, who don't know, so rare is, is a, really, it's not actually poker. It's a, it's a fantasy football game that you play by, by owning NFTs of the different football players. And you set them, you, you set five players in the lineup every week and you compete against all the other managers uh, in the game. And prizes are given out every week based on the real world performances of those players that you own. And so, so the the prize is that the yield that you mentioned. Exactly. Yeah. So mm. so rare pays out uh, ETH. Uh, you know, to to the winners, uh, the top, basically the podium, they get paid ETH, which can be quite quite lucrative. I was just checking my results from uh, the midweek games, and I think myself, I pulled in about three three ETH, which is amazing. Which is an okay result, but we can usually do a little better, but. Uh, Three, and then there's also a lot of cards uh, that are given out, so past the podium, so fourth through. Uh, these days, they're paying out a lot of cards. Hundreds of places are, are winning cards. Uh, obviously, the higher up you go, the more valuable the card you, you, you can likely stand to win. And, you know, those cards can be worth actually more than the ETH sometimes. If you get lucky and you pull a Mbappe or a Messi, you know, that card can be with, worth 10 to 30 ETH on its own. So that's another fun part of the game. Amazing. And I mean, I have a ton of questions on this, but I just want to give Tony a chance to, to kind of talk about what, uh, yeah, what are you focused on then? So, yeah, I'm the community manager for Blackpool Academy and one of the three actually managers of that vertical. Mostly my time is spent dealing directly with the scholars in the academy and the Blackpool Academy is really the scholarship division of Blackpool HQ, where our Blackpool-owned NFTs are then utilized by active players to generate yield. Blackpool's real main focus is on these yield-generating NFTs. The Academy was sort of set up oh, about six, eight months ago, maybe, to, to help players monetize their in-game time by investing specific NFTs that are leased to gamers via scholarships. And if you don't really understand the scholarship model, it sort of took off with Axie Infinity by mistake. It was a sort of a a system where players had all these excess NFTs that could generate yield. But of course, you can't play hundreds of NFTs yourself. You can only play three in a team of Axie. So someone said, well, I'll lend it to a friend, I'll lend it to another friend and we'll split their income. And then that just sort of grew organically on top of the whole system to evolve into the sort of play to earn mechanic that's, that's established now. Incredible. And what's the onboarding process for a new user? And like, what? how does it work? What are the mechanics of that? Like, what safeguards do you have in place? Mm, so this is an interesting question. The The onboarding process generally is, uh, we don't heavily advertise. It's mostly through word of mouth. Yet by doing that, we have over 10,000 people in the academy discord where people are actively trying to Incredible. compete for jobs. Yeah, it's, it's, it's gone pretty quickly. Uh, we have an onboarding system where you would just fill in a Google form and wait, pretty much. Uh, we try the, – the goal is to give everyone that wants an account one. We are limited in how many accounts we can create. Um, we do have frequent competitions from time to time to sort of jump people ahead of the queue, priority, things like that. Uh, where there is – in terms of onboarding, we have trivia and quizzes and educational sessions. We have training and coaching from established scholars that have moved up into sort of semi-managerial roles as well. And they, they sort of assess people and say, oh, we've looked at these 20 people. These these are the top 10 that are really worth getting on because it's it's – the game itself is actually fairly complicated. It's quite deceptively looking like a sort of Pokemon clone until you get this into it. Axie. Axie. This yeah. is Axie, yeah. Okay. So I, I will say that the Academy is not you know, purely based on Axie. It is at the moment because mm-hmm. it's the largest NFTs we have and it's the way we introduce the people. Whereas Soret has three managers that utilize their NFTs, whereas mm-hmm. we have 
In terms of axes right now, we have 2,720 axes, which are utilized over 685 scholars. So it's a bit sort of spread out. Mm. Uh, which is a lot more intensive. But then the advantage of that is a huge amount of human capital. I'm not sure, actually, AJ, how, how intensive is so rare to play on a day-to-day basis? How often are you actively uh, playing the game? It's a, it's a full-time job, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm on it all the time. I, I say to my wife, like, um, I'm working right now. But at the same time, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she seems to be playing a, basically a video game. But but I'm like, you know, it's not. It's also not working because this is what I would be doing if I if it was just my hobby. <laughs> like, this is my mm-hmm. dream uh, job in a sense. Wow. Anyway. But yeah, it's a full time. So with with actually scholars, when you start off, it can be a bit of a grind. But as you rank up, you earn more SLP per day. So you can be over and done in two hours. And that's your that's your wages done for the day. So the advantage there is if you have this huge human capital and then multiple verticals, they can do two hours of this, two hours of another game, two hours of another game, and mm-hmm. really start raking in money. And so just could you just dive into that a little bit, explain in detail how they earn essentially a salary? Mm, yeah. So Axie itself has an in-game token called smooth love potion which is Mm -hmm. slp and that is rewarded to players for partaking in various events in the game be it a pve adventure where there's no stakes you just sort of grind it out and play again or a pvp arena where you play against other live players similar to many other online games uh hearthstone comes to mind it's quite similar in terms of card draw and things like that and it's basically a card game at the end of the day although animations play out on top with the with the characters and winning a game based upon your mmr or rank gives you a certain amount of slp if you have quite a low rank you're getting one or two a day but some of our high ranked competitive esport players are earning 20 to 25 slp per win and then they can play up to 60 games a day so these guys that they're suddenly making a large amounts of money compared to your things what does that translate Sorry. into in in usd terms if they were playing the, the 60 games a day if they're playing a big game, you, you're looking at sort of, oh, you can get eight, nine hundred SLP a day. And it's currently, I think, at sort of eight cents, something like mm-hmm. that. That's a, forgive me to do a calculator quickly. So, so I think the average is about eight fifty divided by hundred. So, uh, about eight and a half dollars a day, mm-hmm. which, you know, is nothing to sneer at. It used to be 40 cents the SLP. So it's come down a fair bit and it is slowly tracking up. And this, a lot of the mechanics down to Sky Mavis, the owners of the game changing things. But what's interesting is the reason the scholarship model is really taken off is in the developing world. You've got countries where, you know, eight, eight and a half dollars a day is above the minimum wage. It's interesting because I've had scholars often tell me their story. You get, you know, information and they tell you a background of why they're applying for a scholarship. And I've had people saying, you know, their, their financial situation so, you know, I've seen people in my village do very, very well playing Axie. I don't want to be doing my job anymore. I want to be playing this game for my phone. And the, the ease of onboarding is what's really taking to, to take off. You don't need, you know, if you compare it to, I think a way you can look at the academy is it's similar to sort of a rideshare app, Uber, mm-hmm. Lyft, that kind of thing, right? We pair people who want to earn money with games. So if you've got a, a, the Uber, for example, pairs people who want to earn while driving and need a lift, Blackpool Academy will connect people who want to make money playing games with the NFTs that they need to access this play to earn game. Unfortunately, these NFTs are very expensive. Mm. A decent Axie team has set you back a, a grand and a half in USD. To USD. So, and so what's what's the, the mechanism in place for ensuring that like a player doesn't just walk off with the NFT? It's a tricky one. So it's actually quite an interesting point. The NFTs are not ever actually owned by them. We mm. the way actually set up is we create the accounts and you need a seed phrase and a Ronin login specific to that account that lets you access it and send tokens out of it and move the NFTs around our scholar accounts. The scholar gets us a little limited access to the account through just password access that's designed to play the game because the game is recorded on chain, but the actual playing of the game is off. So they don't actually have access to the wallets where everything's stored. So the actual risk is all on the scholars' side. And this is where you're better off with a big guild like Blackpool because the only risk we take is our reputation. And if we turn around and rob all of our scholars, we're not going to have any scholars anymore. Mm-hmm. But these smaller guilds who have you know, 20, 30 scholars, an independent manager, if you will, they have the ability to lease out scholars, have them work for a month. When it comes to cash out time, delete all contact, change their name and ghost them keeping 100% of the share for themselves. And I have hundreds of scholars a week message me saying, my last manager scammed me. I'm promising to do the game. I know. Oh, no, very common. They say, you know, I worked for two months, came to cash out time, 
they just disappeared, changed name, changed account, oh, new identity, yeah. load the accounts again. And, you know, that that's just strap slavery, exploitation. So the real risk is with them. The, the only risk we have is the scholars could multi-account where they own two different accounts from different academies, different guilds. Mm-hmm. And when you're caught doing that, the accounts get banned. And the ban is actually over 6,000 days for the axes, which means they cannot be sold on the marketplace. They cannot be bred. They cannot be playing the game. So they're just – because you own the NFT, right? They can't confiscate that. They can't delete it, but they can stop it using all their facilities. So you just can't mm. use the NFT anymore. So that's the only risk we have, but that's kind of negligible. I think we've we've had one case of that out of nearly 700 scholars over eight months. And there are ways to detect that. And we actually found out before it was flagged as an issue. So we removed the scholar, but that was, that was something out there. So what's interesting though, is there are new games coming out that have a mechanism for scholarship built in with smart contracts where you would go to an independent marketplace and you would sign a contract saying, I want to use these NFTs for X amount of time for X split of the yield at the end and both parties sign it. And the way you go, you've got a scholarship set up on chain at the end of the time period, NFTs are returned. They're untransferable during that time. Uh, there's a lot of games coming up with this kind of model. So this sort of, built upon the scholarship model that already exists for Axie. It's, it's a fascinating model. You know, where and where are you guys seeing the most reception? Like, I mean, I've seen, you know, some of the photos of you've got a few teams in the Philippines. Oh, on the blog, this is, yeah. Um, we The Philippines has become a cultural phenomenon. That, like, I would say it's akin to StarCraft in Korea. It is Incredible. ridiculous how big Axie is over there. The local radio gives you the SLP price every day. Because there's so many people. No, it's crazy. Hey, there's so many people playing the game and want to know what the deal is. You can't move for information on Axie there. SLP is accepted at 33% of shops. The government in the Philippines are moving to tax it because they're the problem they have there. It becomes a sort of economic one for the country because all these people are no longer doing street cleaning jobs and food vendors and menial tasks. Why would you do that when you can earn more money for two hours work a day on your phone? You know, and it's untracked, uncashed, uh, un, untaxed rather income. So it's become a big, they, they've mentioned it in their parliament. And I suppose back to your question though. <laughs> mm. The, uh, <laughs> away from the Philippines, we have a big contingent in Venezuela, Brazil, Morocco. Uh, we have some scholars from Indonesia. Mm, Latin America in general is picking up quite fast. There are a few from Russia as well. And I think I have one from France, which, it's unusual. That's that's very interesting. And what would you say is the commonality between these places? Generally, it's it's a poor income and a way to generate either extra income or as a main source of income for these people. So that's the commonality, the though, is that those those countries are, you know, not in great shape economically. Mm. Oh yeah, and, for sure. And that's what's so amazing about this. I, I call it a revolution. Like we're not just a hedge fund and we're not just playing nfts like and we all know this like if you're listening to this podcast you're in the crypto space like you're aware that this is more than just like financial gains like what's happening with crypto is a revolution but this is a whole nother type of revolution the fact that it's becoming a problem in the philippines that people have just decided to take matters into their own hands and they're like yeah we're going to use this slp as our currency now like, that that mm-hmm. is crazy, isn't it? It really is telling that you know, and and the difference between uh, uh, there are more people in the Philippines with Axie accounts and Ronin wallets than there are with credit cards. So they're relying. Oh you know, it's getting to the point where it, the the Ronin side chain is bigger than some banks over there, right? Wow. This is this is a real adoption. Like I said, I think I said in one of my articles on the blog blog blackpool.finance. If you had asked me three or four years ago, which of these chains would be the ones that really break ground and see real world adoption in the public more than just, you know, a little corner shop saying we accept Bitcoin here for an outrageous fee. I would not have picked SLP on the Ronin ETH side chain uh, as the winner. Hey, the other kind of interesting thing is like, I think people in Western countries just have absolutely no idea of the level of adoption for, for mobile gaming in, in Asia. And just game, you know, like kind of online, I, I suppose more kind of whimsical games in some sense, <laughs> not to, um, to, to, to say that's a bad thing, but, um, yeah, it's just, a, it's just such an interesting, it's just such an interesting space in general. It shows that it's real, you know, like to Tony's point that he wouldn't have picked SLP and Ronin to be most widely adopted and actually used currency or, or token, right? It's, right. it's because there's a real application and it makes sense. It's not some marketing buzz and it's not pushed on people. It's like, we should just, we just, 
it just makes sense. We're just going to do this. <laughs> it's right. Yeah. The ability to earn and then spend all in the same wallet. I think simplicity is really the key for this too. I think that's that's true of, of broader adoption in general. You know, to, to have to transfer fiat to crypto, then pay the crypto crypto wallet. When you're earning crypto and spending it, that's just money. Mm. 100%. Right. There's no there's no off-ramp sort of barrier or friction. It, it's um, making people, like, for the first time, actually think, what is money? Like, mm-hmm. I think an entire – many generations just grew up, and it's like, whatever the government tells us, that's the money. Uh, that was the only choice. What, what else were we going to do? But now it's like, wait a second. If money is just – a collective deciding this is a means of exchange. There's other things, of course, but at its base to get to where the Philippines is, that's what they decided. <laughs> uh, it is, it is unbelievable. It's, it's, I mean, there are so many implications. One of the things that I was talking to the Olympus guys about was how DAOs and, and kind of some, you know, these new models, basically, like in some ways, they're more like utopian versions of the, of the gig economy. And I mean, is this, how you see Blackpool moving? Oh yeah, my my wife just put her two weeks uh, notice in at her corporate kidding? job. No, yeah, she's going to come join. But yeah, I, I've broached the idea. You know, like hey, she can contribute. She's smart. Like she's incredible. Just, yeah, and I just saw a meme the other day. I'm sure a lot of people have seen the same one where it's like the the line of no people next to the line of you know everyone's lined up at this other one. And it's mm. you know boomer nine to five job, and mm-hmm. then it's like you know Dow. It's like, it just makes sense. It's, it's just like the Philippines example with SLP. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. we didn't even know this was an option. We thought if you had a job, you had to work in a traditional corporate hierarchy structure, and that was it. Right? No, we just created an entire new model. The, it, actually, no, it goes back to, to our scholars in the Philippines. They this, this is a job for them, right? But it's not this nine to five, show up, do some made up task that has no real value. No, it's like you're you're doing what you get, what you want to do. Like, right. Well, you have a tangible. Like I said about so rare, it's like this is what I would be doing anyway. Can you imagine? I'm sorry, I'm going out trying to like a fanciful like rant here, but no, 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 was, enjoying it. I think about it all the time. I'm like, you know, we, we basically, as a whole, for the most part, live in a world where people don't work jobs that they enjoy. For the most part, there's a few lucky ones who do, but. For the most part, you take a job because it's high paying enough for you to live and get by. And then you use those earnings to essentially offset all the sadness from your real job. <laughs> it's like, mm. well, I made all this money, so let me go buy some stuff, be a consumer or, or have experiences or whatever to make up for the nine to five. And let's be real. Most people in corporate jobs, at least in America where I am, are working way more than nine to five. My wife and everyone else I know works 12 hours every day. Yeah, Americans are famous for that. <laughs> it's, it's horrible, man. It's horrible. It's just this crazy rat race. And then it's like you get to the top or near the top and you're like, oh, this isn't even that good. <laughs> mm. Or people take a job that they do enjoy, they're passionate about, they're good at, and it's not high paying enough. Like that's somehow the society and economic structure that we are at. And that's not great. But I think in a world with NFTs, with several currencies, cryptocurrencies that are not controlled by a government who has its own agenda, Mm -hmm. and and you have DAOs instead of corporate hierarchies that are controlled by a few powerful people. Instead, if we're all a collective and you can have smaller organizations and you're more free and more flexibility, like people will end up doing jobs that they enjoy, that they're good at, and that they will be paid a more than fair wage like can you imagine how good that would be for the whole world like gives me goosebumps yeah you know it it sort of raises a lot of interesting kind of questions what you're saying around like i mean if you think about with globalization in the last few years there's been a lot of like anti-globalization sentiment because it's been through the lens of centralization right like you've had these big corporate (laughs) structures you know your amazons or your walmarts and you know these these big kind of oligarchies and you know they it's like the worst type of of globalization where they they outsource and you know it's just so interesting to see uh, you know globalization through the lens of decentralization now like with what you guys are saying where you're taking a model where it's more of a meritocracy it's more of a based on your your output and it can just be anywhere 
Exactly. Look at us. None of us on this chat are in the same, not even in the same country. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is. It is really fascinating, and I guess just just backing up a little bit. So we've kind of covered that for the for the the guys in the in the academy. You know, they they have a new sort of income stream where they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to acquire the NFTs. And for the for the DAO, you know, you mentioned the yield, but how else does the the DAO benefit from this system? Yeah, Tony, you want to explain the. Um like the revenue split. And that was the other thing I was actually going to comment on before you said that Mm -hmm. is like the meritocracy of it. Tony Mm -hmm. will tell you the numbers here. The the scholars take (laughs) the vast majority of the earnings, which is great. I mean, the Dow benefits because we're in such large numbers. So at the end of the day, it's still a large uh, amount to us, but it is. And everything that we tend to get gets funneled for the moment straight back into growth, which is pumping out more scholar numbers. So the current metrics we get, an SLP yield we get from this game. We put 60% straight to the scholar. 10% are given to the managers, which have to train, assess, cash out, uh, and assign accounts and monitor and, and do all the, the sort of legwork to keep the scholarship running. And then 30% is then allocated to Blackpool, of which we are turning to return yield to BBT holders, state BBT holders at some point soon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's interesting is there was some debate a while ago. I know that other guilds do different, slightly different methods. Uh, there's a, a 50-50 split tends to be the global standard uh, between manager and player. So we give the cards a little bit more. But what's interesting is there are some that take a smaller percentage towards the DAOs themselves. There are other gaming guilds that do this setup. Actually, we're far from unique. I know personally there are over 140 different gaming guilds that are in Axie is the biggest scholarship model game out there. Not that it's the only one, but it is the one that's sort of most prevalent and people think of when you say scholarship NFT games. Mm-hmm. But it gets this sort of debate, really, whether it is worth having a larger percentage to the DAOs, which can then create more scholarships and then help a greater number of people in total than being a very, very high-paying scholarship but helping fewer people which is quite an interesting sort of philosophical debate, Mm. whether you want to help a few people a little or a lot of people perhaps a little less. So it's the big, the big, the great, the the, the sort of tangible amount of good you do in the world. I never thought I'd be doing sort of almost philanthropic work at some point, providing these jobs for people. It's it's really changed my perspective on a lot of things, really. Mm, In what ways? Oh, just that I, I wouldn't have to be, uh, I saw it very much, uh, I saw myself as just earning money for myself. Um, but not only am I creating jobs for people, or we, I should say, but also the, the, the advancement for it. So one of the examples is we, the managers within our guilds are sourced from scholars themselves. When a scholar's played enough and gone excellent at the game and understanding with things, they're treated to a bit of a better account, premium account, uh, can earn more money. And then above that, they're given these jobs as managers, so we sort of promote from within. We call it graduating from the scholarship, uh, which is, becomes then an actual full-time job. So instead of playing two hours a day to fit in with whatever your lifestyle is, be it your you know, grandparent or someone with another job on the side, you become a full-time actually manager where you are looking after 50 to 100 other scholars yourself. Uh, and these guys are getting a lot of sort of respect in their community. People are approaching them, oh, can you get me into Blackpool? I hear you're one of the, the top guys there now. So that's really interesting to be able to make such a difference to people. I mean, I do a lot of the work for the community newsletter that goes out every every month or so. And the stories, the things these people are doing, the generosity is unreal. There's a real sort of pay it forward attitude to these guys earning. You, you can see some of the pictures and things on there of these little projects they have of soup kitchens, feeding programs, uh, supplying schools. Someone's paying for dialysis for a stranger with money they've got from Axie. You know, it's crazy. That's absolutely unreal. How do you guys see this model scaling over time? I mean, the variety of upcoming NFT games, and um, we've recently aped into Avagotchi. Mm, I was um, going to ask. <laughs> mm, I think it's going to come up at some point where we're looking to form a guild, which is going to be another play to earn model with a scholarship model involved in that as well, where you'd be using your own NFTs on Blackpool property lands, or you'd be u- utilizing our own ones lent out to you in the exact same scholarship model as, as, as other games. But yeah, the more and more verticals we get, the more games and more ways there are to do things, especially some of the elite ones. It's not all targeted to scholars and low-income earners that want to have a play-to-earn experience. There are, within games, prohibitively expensive 
items that are going to come out. You look at games like Star Atlas, they've got million to $10 million spaceships, right? Mm. No one's going to, no one can buy that, but a large guild could and then fractionalize it and have shared ownership between its DAO members and lease it out to people. Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting is that a long term goal in Blackpool is to provide this democratized access to the scarcest non fungible assets that individual users won't be able to buy themselves. And that's, mm. sometimes it's people that want to play with these really elite items, be it something from an RPG or some rare card game, all the way up to crazy expensive items. And it's sort of the bridge between the, the DAO and the players. Is it possible that as a result of this kind of um, shared ownership model that NFT markets that are not gamified could be gamified by Blackpool. There is a real side to gamification and an appeal to the sort of person that likes DeFi and NFTs. I had a friend who used a fitness app that was set up like an RPG where you earned points and stats and Mm. number go up is a really powerful motivator psychologically for a lot of people whether it be your bank balance whether it be you know Mm -hmm. statistics in a game and if you apply that to other things the game application process is quite powerful in motivating people it's so interesting to see how quickly nfts uh, are taking off with with gamification i really see the ownership of i mean nfts in general have such a wide scope and for me i don't really understand the art side of things i don't get into a pixelated avatar that costs thousands of ETH. It's it's the use of them as gaming items where you're rewarded intrinsically for this value you've put into a game. Coming from a big background of, say, online RPGs, uh, RuneScape and World of Warcraft and things, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours into this. And at the end of the day, I ended up selling the account to someone online for like 400 bucks. And it was like eight years worth of my life poured into this Mm. game. And I had no, uh, you know, it didn't reflect what I felt the effort and time went into it. Yeah. Not that I feel entitled to earn it because I got experience at playing the game. But the point is, with the NFT way of doing things, people will be able to be rewarded for doing this. Mm. It will be an actual sustainable career choice. And it, it, mass adoption of these things, it's not a case of if. It is a case of when. There are Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro are already looking at it. They see this huge untapped market. If you look at, say, Magic of the Gathering, for example, there is this second-hand market for magic cards that is untouched. It's a huge market. People want to play cards and build decks, and they just buy it secondhand through various things like that. If you mint the NFTs yourself as a huge company, you can be getting by 1%, whatever it be, off all the subsequent second-hand market transactions for your cards within a game that's digital. Now, that is a huge untapped market. And the guys, mm-hmm. I, I know people at both these companies, they are looking at them. The big players are coming, and it's about the adoption and how well it's done. And I think it's going to be sort of subtle and in the background. I don't think the average person is going to be that into, you know, true blockchain or DeFi technology. They're just going to know that on their PlayStation account, they have this axe they can take from one game to the next game to the next game, and they can sell Mm -hmm. it when they're done. They're going to be uh, in the same way that, you know, my grandparents do not know how Netflix works. They don't even know where it's on the internet. They just know you turn the telly on and there's streaming <laughs> content. They don't know streams. streams. TV doesn't have ads now. You just pick what you want. And, you know, it's that simplicity is part of the success of actually how easy it is to onboard. Mm-hmm. And I think over time, we're going to see more and more games become easier and easier to onboard and easier and easier to play. And then suddenly everything is going to be an NFT within gaming spaces. I had this conversation with uh, Andrew on the Zima Red is that at that point, what you just described, Tony, going back to my, uh, I I just love talking about like the the world landscape, economics, and all this is like, Mm -hmm. that is sort of just like a base income for almost anyone who cares. It's it's crazy that universal basic income may end up coming from games. Isn't that fascinating <laughs> to think about? Like, no, yeah. I'm ready for that. Like, it, you go back to Pac-Man. Look at that. That this is going to evolve into something that's going to give every human being enough to not starve. What? Yes. <laughs> Amazing. Yes. And then that goes to what I was saying, where like then people can actually do the jobs that they want. So sure, they log on yeah. their phone for two days, they grind it out on a game that you know they kind of enjoy. Oh, sure, okay, okay. Now I can have my bread for the day, my water, and it'll pay my rent over the month. And then it. the rest of the day, I can go and be a teacher or a firefighter or whatever it is that you care about and actually improve the world, you know? Yeah, I see it as, a, as an ultimate good end use case for technology. A lot of technology gets a bad mm-hmm. rap. You look at social mm-hmm. media and whatnot. And the, the automation we are getting within society has been so insidious and subtle, people haven't picked up on it. But right. when you when you look at things like uh, you have self-checkouts in the States there. Oh, right? yeah. So 
the, when I was a kid, there was 40 checkout girls you had to go up and beep, beep, go through or go to the guy and get checked out. Whereas now there's one guy looking after 20 self checkouts yeah. and you get so jobs. Oh. Even a vending machine is a sort of job, right? Let, let me tell you this. This is actually, I'm glad you brought that up. So I used to work at Whole Foods, Amazon, and here in Austin is the corporate headquarters. So that's where I worked for Whole Foods. When, when we got acquired by Amazon, everyone was freaking out. Like, oh my gosh, all this technology is going to take over. And of course, of course, typical corporate structure. You got the, the CEO and all the important executives at Whole Foods going, oh, no, 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 that'll never happen. We'll never have self-checkout. That would, that would kill jobs. And I was actually in HR uh, in doing uh, data science in HR. And so like, I knew the exact implications and they would ask for it. And it's like, you know, anyways, for years, they're saying, no, we'll never have self-checkout. Yeah, went to the Whole Foods the other day here. Of course, it's all self-checkout now. It's mm. like, it's just like you're saying, it's subtle. It's just happening. Yeah, it happens so slowly. A few powerful people and organizations, and nobody can do anything about it. But that's where NFTs and gamification and universal basic income through these games can mm. help offset that. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is, I was, I was just thinking about what you were saying before about convincing your wife to, to come and to jump on the bandwagon. Yeah. But I feel like, again, thinking about my experience in Asia, where like there's a you know huge informal work economy in most Asian countries, you know, and people are very flexible. They will just do, you know, they might, I mean, most people have, five jobs you know they, they will literally do whatever it takes to bring in income and versus in western countries we have this very fixed and rigid mindset about having mm -hmm. a job and having a career that yeah maybe doesn't really fit with where we are yeah it's it's just it, it just raises so many interesting questions yeah exactly man yeah so so my wife was saying like okay well like what's my job like what would my title be and all this right. and that. i'm like i'm like it doesn't work like that like yeah. obviously you have a certain who cares? Skill set that we can say at least one thing you'll bring to the table but you're, you're just a smart person like you'll fill in gaps where we need help you'll be able to pick it up like don't worry about it i mean we have people tony of course but i'm thinking of other people in the dow who like joined just playing some of our our smaller games and verticals mm. not actually in so rare and I was like, oh, cool. Like this person's here. Awesome. And like, that was several months ago. And now, like, if I were to give them a title, I'm like, oh, this person's like head of partnerships. But it's like, they could have never, no corporate job would have ever hired them to be like head of partnerships at their company. No, they just like grew into it. And it's like, mm. you're smart and you're good at this. So you do it for us. <laughs> like, yeah. A lot of the corporate structure is, is who you know. And if the person uh -huh. above you likes you, you move up. Whereas mm -hmm. here, no one's really above you. And if everyone likes you, then you move up. You know, sort of a, <laughs> it's just the easy the iron thing. And so if you gel well with the team and you're aware of other people, this, this DAO structure is really rewarding. I think without the, the labels, you know, because I, mm. like I said, I said I'm community manager. Community manager is about 40% of what I do. I do work for the Blackpool Lab where we research upcoming verticals where we look at nfts we do human capital management where i do a bit of marketing i do a bit of advertising i do a bit of this stuff you know everything it's it's all encompassing and that keeps it fresh as well mm. you, you, whereby by wearing many different hats and not actually being tied to any of them where our resources are needed we have more people allocated at the time hey who's free to do this oh we are great let's all jump on there and do that oh this is an interesting project who wants to do this yeah we do and it's it's much more fluid yeah, it is. It is super interesting, like being in a DAO and just the way that you relate to people is so different, isn't it? Compared to a, a traditional corporate structure. But you're always worried, like, who's this person? What's their positioning? Mm. You know, but how, how do I? Yeah, no, this is more like, honestly, it just feels like hanging out with friends. And we're doing right. something working towards a, a common goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I, I did want to bring it back. <laughs> mm -hmm. this is funny this is funny where we went starting with quantitative hedge fund <laughs> that's who we are. right people probably thought it was going to be like a dry like financial class. yeah you guys maybe you guys need to rethink that that that, that well, name i don't think I it mean, does it justice maybe perhaps i mean we do use a lot of machine learning and analytics looking at our metrics that come in i mean what we publish on the website is only a small fraction of the actual data we harvest from all of our verticals from things like time spent in gain yield generation average yield we have uh, within each vertical we have uh, data ripped from 
uh, APIs from from blockchain itself, looking at all these things to work out the best possible way of investing things. So there's a lot of rather than sort of gut feeling, it is all backed up by numbers. And we have a quite a diverse team of, I mean, away from us guys, it's sort of faces and the thing. There's a huge amount of devs in the background. There are lots of analytical guys. There are numbers guys, accountants, lawyers, all sorts of things that are running, keeping it all ticking over as well. Yeah, we're really lucky with our, our analysts and devs. I was going to maybe drop some, some alpha. I mean, nothing, Please. nothing solid, but just some <laughs> ideas that we're, we're kicking around. I mean, we've been kicking around for a while. We're just kind of waiting for the right opportunity to implement it. But some things we've said for a while that we could do that, that make Blackpool even more interesting than some of our, uh, the other options that exist out there, which there's not many if you want exposure to the NFT space. But I mean, there's been talks about, being able to, because right now you just, your options are you, you hold BPT, which is good. So you, you kind of get the governance vote and price appreciation. Uh, if you stake your BPT, you know, then you're, um, you're in the, the yield distribution pool, which is nice. But on top of that, that's the entire pool. What if you don't like so rare and it, you know, or you only like Axie? So like potentially you'd be able to stake only towards Axie or potentially be able to short some of the verticals that we have as we grow we're going to have you know tens potentially a hundred verticals there there could be strategies on there that are kind of uh, built upon like the technology at stake out strategies and you can say you can do like what are some of these options that you guys have at stake out now that, that look option that look awesome like you'd say i want to go long on all guild related verticals that blackpool has and i want to short all these high stake poker expensive nft mm. games you know, or vice versa, or you could yeah, bet we, on certain managers yeah. even, right? What if you, you know, the three managers that's so rare, what if you say, yeah, no, this AJ guy, phew, he doesn't know what he's doing. Like you know, short <laughs> him and go along the other two managers. Uh, short AJ. Um, <laughs> I think that's probably a kind of a good place to, to wrap things up. Thanks a lot for coming on the, the podcast today, guys. It's been super fun. I think, as more and more people discover what you guys are doing, yeah, I, I think this will just grow into something that's a, a huge movement. So definitely excited to to, to have you guys back on in, in a few months or something. But, yeah, yeah, that would be great. We'll, we'll put yeah. our, our finance guys and developers on. <laughs> Maybe it'd be a different conversation. You know? <laughs> awesome, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us, Johnny. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers, guys.